For those who haven't read the first part of this story, please acquaint yourself with the rules below. It's not following them will result in dire consequences. Your shift begins at 10 p.m. and ends at 6 a.m. You are to follow the following rules. If you wish for your shift to be a successful one. Rule number one. The cemetery closes at midnight. No visitors are allowed to enter it after it closes. Once the clock hits midnight, walk around the cemetery and make sure that any visitors already inside leave the area immediately. Rule number two. When the clock strikes 1 a.m., a tall, bald male with dark brown eyes and a white goatee will stand right at the entrance gate of the cemetery. You should let this man inside the cemetery without talking to him. His presence will not be felt, so he will not disturb you. Rule number three. Between 1.15 a.m. and 5.30 a.m., you may hear an organ start to play from within the chapel and the lights of the chapel may begin to flicker. Do not worry. You have no reason to be afraid unless you enter the chapel during this time. Rule number four. You may hear noises from the mausoleum at any time during your shift. Do not approach the mausoleum during this time. No matter what noise you hear, or how loud you hear them, they will eventually subside on their own. Rule number five. At 2 a.m., you may hear knocking on the door of the guardhouse. Open the door, and you will be greeted by either a weeping girl or a disfigured male. If the weeping girl was the cause of the knocking, escort her to the mausoleum, unlock the door for her, and make sure to lock the door once she enters the mausoleum. If your guest is the disfigured male. Close the guardhouse door and lock it the moment you see him. Either turn your head away from all windows or close your eyes and wait until the knocking comes to a full stop. Only then can you continue your shift like nothing happened. Rule number six. If the weeping girl knocks on the door and you hear noises coming from the mausoleum, let the girl into the guardhouse instead and wait until you no longer hear any noises coming from the mausoleum. Then refer to the whole of rule five. Rule number seven. It is mandatory that you leave the guardhouse before 4.20 a.m. You are free to do anything while abiding by all the above rules during the time. During this time, you will feel you are no longer alone. You will feel you are being watched at any moment. You might run into a few people roaming around the grave sites. 
If this is the case, avoid eye contact and do not interact with them at all costs. You are allowed back into the guardhouse by 4.50 a.m. Rule number eight. Enter the guardhouse by 5 a.m. At this point, at this point, you're not allowed anywhere else outside of the main guardhouse. Not even the bathroom. If for whatever reason you cannot enter the guardhouse before 5 a.m., run into the chapel and lock the door behind you. Inside the chapel, search for the bald man and remain close to him at all times. Do not talk to him or touch him in any way. Simply, simply stay within conversing distance of him. They will not harm you if you stay next to him. Rule number nine. By 6 a.m., open the gates and wait for the next security guard to take over. Your shift is not over until the next guard arrives or until 8 a.m. Do not leave the cemetery until the next guard arrives or if it's 8 a.m. Rule number 10. If no guard arrives by 8 a.m., you are free to leave, but not before you go to the chapel, where you will find the bald man from earlier. Tell him that your shift is over, but no guard has taken over yet. Once he acknowledges that, you are free to leave until your next shift begins. The next morning after my shift was a blur as I tried to process the events of that first night. It felt like a dream, a bizarre nightmare that left me questioning my sanity. I used all the free time I had to search for clues, details or any information about Acropolis but I only found two references about them online. The first was a news article written on June 19th of 2009. It detailed how Necropolis was a privately owned cemetery that belonged to the Abaddon family, an immigrant family that came to our town sometime after World War II but they vanished without a trace on June 13th, 1955. Only their youngest daughter was found, badly bruised and malnourished, right outside the gates of the cemetery. A day later, the cemetery was burned to the ground, and all that remained was buried in a mass grave by the locals for fear of awakening any demons. Many theories arose, ranging from a kidnapping to a supposed cult sacrifice to a murder-suicide. But to this day, the disappearance remains a mystery. Using the information I learned from the first reference, I tracked a user profile on social media with the name of Molly Abaddon. Her profile didn't have any information whatsoever. She had no likes, no posts, and was following no one. Her profile banner was just an icon, the default one you'd automatically get when creating a profile. However, she was being followed by a single account with the name Molly Brown. 
The profile was pretty active. Comments, likes, and whatnot. The latest post was of a picture of a cute puppy. Posted just two days ago. Doing more research on the public databases. I found out that there is only one person within 300 miles whose last name is Abaddon. At least that is what her last name was before she got married and changed it to Brown. The person I found was a 76 year old widow. So it matches up with when the Abaddon family came to town. Scamming through the profile I found, I pieced together where I thought she lived. Now yes, I know that's very invasive of me. I need to know more about Necropolis. And it doesn't require a genius to know that this person is related to the cemetery and its history. I sent Molly a friend request and waited for her to accept or decline it. I eventually dozed off for a few hours before awakening to knocking on my front door. I checked my phone. It was 9.24 p.m. I hadn't ordered anything. So who would be at my door, I wondered. I waited for a few moments before the knocking stopped and a white piece of paper slid underneath my door. I picked up the paper and on it was written, Make any further contact with her and there will be dire consequences. The words on the paper sent a shiver down my spine. No doubt, whoever had left the message knew about my research into Molly Abaddon and her connection to Necropolis. My mind raced with the thought of who could have left this warning. Was it Mr. Damien? Was it someone else? involved with the mysterious occurrences in the cemetery. The idea that someone was watching me, monitoring my actions, filled me with a great sense of unease. I stared at the message, my thoughts still racing. I knew I needed to be cautious, to thread carefully. Whoever was behind this was clearly intent on keeping secrets hidden. And I had inadvertently stumbled upon something much bigger than I could have imagined. The feeling of being trapped, of being entangled in a web of mystery and danger closed in around me. I felt as if I were a piece in a game of chess. I was weak and it seemed as if I had no control over what I could and couldn't do. How did they know that I wanted to contact Molly? The more I thought about it, the more questions arose and the more I regretted accepting the job. Do I take the risk and contact Molly anyways? Or do I abide by the rules, like the pawn I am? Do I leave this small, pathetic town I live in and attempt to escape from it all? Or do I uncover the truth of Necropolis? My mind raced to find a solution. And by the time I thought of an idea, it was already time for my next shift. I decided that whatever the history of Necropolis is, it would be my job to warn others about it 
and possibly put an end to it. I was already too deep in, so I might as well take this entire place and its history down with me. Eventually, I gathered my courage and I found myself once again driving through the forest towards Necropolis. The memory of the tall bald man and the weeping girl haunted my thoughts. The eerie melody of the organ lingered in my mind and the note I received kept reminding me to thread carefully. I parked my car and stared at the entrance gates, my heart racing. I knew there was no turning back now. I entered the cemetery to find Mr. Damien waiting by the door of the guardhouse. I hesitantly made my way towards him. All the while, thoughts of the note occupied my mind. The few seconds it took to reach Mr. Damien felt like an eternity, and his presence was just as unsettling as the first time I met him. He greeted me with a nod, his lips curling into a faint smile that never reached his eyes. That was the first time I saw his face display any sort of expression. Remember the rules, Mr. Ingram. He said his voice like a whisper that seemed to echo in my mind. Follow them to the letter and you will be safe. Unlike the guard who relieved you of your first shift. I nodded. My throat dry as I replied. Yes, sir, I understand. With that, he turned and walked away, disappearing beyond the gates of the cemetery. I watched him go, a feeling of dread settling in the pit of my stomach. I took a deep breath and stepped into the guardhouse, the weight of the unknown pressing down on me. My mind repeated his words. Follow them to the letter and you will be safe. Unlike the guard who relieved you of your first ship. No doubt that guard got killed. But in what way? The guardhouse felt even smaller this time. Its walls closing in on me. I changed into the security guard outfit and picked up the piece of paper. The words now etched into my memory. The rules were bizarre, nonsensical, but I will follow them no matter what. As the clock struck 10 p.m., I settled onto my chair. My eyes fixated on the vintage radio. I hesitated before turning it on. And this time, the crackling static felt like a familiar companion. The eerie sound seemed to fill the guardhouse, mingling with the tension that hung in the air. I tried to distract myself by staring out of the window. My gaze fixed on the chapel in the distance. The memories of the previous night's events flooded my mind, and I shivered despite the warmth of the room. How had I let myself get into this situation? And as per rule one, I walked out of the guardhouse and into the chilling cold outside, patrolling the grave sites and ensuring that there were no visitors on this side of the gates. I made my way back into the guardhouse, 
once the cemetery was free of outsiders. Minutes turned into hours, and the air grew thick with anticipation. Every creak and rustle seemed magnified, and I found myself jumping at the slightest sound. I glanced at the clock. My heart sank as the hands inched closer to 1 a.m. I went out out of the guardhouse when I first saw him again. The bald man. I walked to the gates of the cemetery and let him in. Just like last time, he made no noise. His eyes transfixed on the chapel. And he didn't seem to acknowledge my presence. I made sure to stay out of his way and not to talk to him as he entered the chapel and closed the door behind him. Instead of going back into the guardhouse, I made my way to the mausoleum. A tall structure stood before me and I felt weak, small, and scared as hell. It felt almost like I was staring up at my creator. I unlocked the door to the mausoleum, and with a heavy gasp, I made my way in. I closed the door behind me before beginning to look around the inside of the mausoleum. I didn't know why I was there, but it felt like the right decision. I was looking for something, but I didn't know what it was. I read the golden plaques affixed on the top of the sarcophagus. They had the names, dates of birth, and dates of death, the bodies entombed within them. I read the last one, and I made a realization. None of the sarcophagi housed a person who died past 1955. The most recent death I could read was June 10th, 1955, just three days before the Abaddons vanished. I suddenly heard a sound, the organ's haunting melody began to fill the air. This time it sounded sad, tragic, as if telling a morning story. On the first night it sounded eerie, like a warning. This time it sounded like a goodbye. Its mournful notes sent shivers down my spine. I clenched my fists, fighting the urge to run. I remember the rules. Stay away from the chapel during this time. Fortunately for me, the mausoleum isn't that close to the chapel. I walked around the interior of the mausoleum for a bit, searching for anything out of the ordinary. And I found it. A single stone, slightly extending outside of the wall facing the entrance of the mausoleum. This seemed odd to me because the mausoleum was perfect. That wasn't an exaggeration. A place was perfect apart from this one stone. This place felt almost too perfect. It was too clean, too new. The smell wasn't good nor bad. The linings and the drawings on the wall were perfect. Every centimeter of the structure was perfect. Apart from that single piece of stone sticking out of the wall. My heart raced as I stared at the protruding stone. It seemed out of place in the sea of pristine perfection that was the mausoleum. 
I knew instinctively that there was something hidden behind that brick. Something that wasn't meant to be discovered. I hesitated for a moment. The tragic music echoing in my ears. The rules never stated anything against me entering the mausoleum. Unless I heard noises coming from within it. Fortunately for me, the only noises in the structure were my own. Either way, my curiosity got the better of me. With a mixture of fear and determination, I pushed on the brick, feeling slight resistance before it gave way and slid into the wall. The wall revealed a small compartment. Inside it lay an old, leather-bound book. I gingerly picked it up, my heart pounding in my chest. The pages were yellowed with age, and the cover felt worn and withered. The title was embossed in faded gold letters. Chronicles of Necropolis. I hesitated, my fingers hovering over the book. The sense of danger was palpable, and I felt as if I were on the precipice of discovering something far beyond my mortal comprehension. I knew that reading this book will probably reveal secrets that were meant to stay buried, but my curiosity was insatiable. With trembling hands, I opened the book to its first page and began to read. The entries were written in an elegant cursive script, dated back over a few decades. The tales within spoke of rituals, sacrifices, and a pact made with dark forces in exchange for wealth, power, and longevity. As I read, I began to realize the true nature of Necropolis. It was not just a cemetery. It was a nexus of supernatural energy. A place where the boundary between the living and the dead was thin. The Abaddon family, driven by greed and ambition, had made a pact with an unknown entity known as the Keeper of Souls. This entity granted them the means to accumulate wealth and power in exchange for the souls of the long deceased within the cemetery. Over time, the Abaddons had used the souls to prolong their lives, ensuring their immortality while causing suffering to those whose remains were bound to the necropolis. The rituals conducted in the chapel were not just for show. They were part of a larger design to maintain the link between the living and the dead. To harness the energy of the souls and fuel their twisted desires. Eventually, not enough souls were available to be harnessed by the Keeper of Souls. So he took most of the family's souls and only kept Molly alive, badly bruised and malnourished, as a warning for others to heed. The land the Cropless once stood on was eventually brought back by someone who reconstructed and reopened the cemetery. The book doesn't say who that person is. The more I read, the more I realized 
the magnitude of the darkness that had enveloped Necropolis. The weeping girl I had encountered, the apparitions, and the haunting melody of the organ. They were all connected to the malevolent power that lingered within the cemetery. As I delved deeper into the pages, I learned of the curse that had been placed upon the Abaddon family. The curse ensured that they could never leave Necropolis, bound to the very place they had profaned. The Keeper of Souls have turned them into eternal guardians of the cemetery, cursed to protect the dark secret they had unleashed. My heart raced as the truth settled over me, like a suffocating shroud. I had unwittingly stepped into a battle between the forces of darkness and those who sought to free the trapped souls. The warning I had received, the veiled threats, it was all a desperate attempt to keep the truth hidden. But every page I turned, I realized the magnitude of my role in this story. I was not just an observer. I was a potential disruptor of the twisted balance that had been maintained for generations. I could be the key to freeing the souls trapped within the Necropolis. Or I could be the catalyst for even greater suffering. Or I could be the next to join the suffering. My mind raced. My heart pounding in my chest as I read further into the chronicles of Necropolis. The truth was like a weight on my shoulders, and I felt the gravity of the decision I had to make. I had a hard choice to make, a choice that could determine the fate of the souls trapped within Necropolis, and my own destiny as well. Would I risk my sanity, my life, my soul, to free those who once rested easily. My heart sank as I thought of my options. No matter what I did, I had to do it soon. Hastily, I took as many pictures of the pages of the book as I could before I returned it to where I originally found it, making sure to place the stone hiding in its place as well. I then left the mausoleum and locked the door behind me before returning to the guardhouse. All the while the organ inside the chapel played a glum tone and echoed within my head. As the night wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the very darkness itself was alive with hidden eyes. The words of the book echoed in my mind, the stories of rituals and curses. I had become part of something beyond my understanding, a battle between supernatural forces that I had never believed in. I glanced at the clock. My heart sank as the minutes ticked closer to 2 a.m. The dread grew within me and my mind raced with thoughts of the weeping girl and the disfigured man. Rules 5 and 6 played out in my head, and I knew that my actions could have dire consequences. As expected, right as the clock ticked 2 a.m., a soft knock on the door of the guardhouse made me jump. I hesitated, unsure of what I would find on the other side. I slowly approached the door, my hand trembling as I reached for the handle. With a deep breath, 
I swung open the door, revealing the figure before me. It was the weeping girl again, just like on my first shift. Her face obscured by tears, her sobs echoing in the stillness of night. She looked at me with pleading eyes, and my heart ached at the sight of her torment. I had a choice to make. A choice that could alter the course of this night. Following the rules had brought me this far. But now I stood at a crossroads. Rule 5 instructed me to lead her to the mausoleum, to unlock the door and let her in. But what if there was another way? What if I could break the cycle? Defy the darkness that had ensnared her and so many others. The organ music continued its mournful melody. The notes growing louder in my ears. Time seemed to stand still. As I grappled with my decision, my heart ached for her suffering. But the book's revelations warn of the darkness that lay within Necropolis. I decided to do as the rule said. I took the girl to the mausoleum, opened the door for her, and locked it after making sure she went in. I made my way back to the guardhouse while the organ subsided, and all I could hear was myself. I felt... I felt dreadful. I couldn't shake that I was just a pawn in an evil game. My every move orchestrated by forces beyond my control. The air in the guardhouse felt heavy, oppressive, as if the very walls were closing in on me, inch by inch. I sat there, my thoughts a jumbled mess, the weight of my choices pressing down on me. The night dragged on, and the sense of unease never left me. The minutes stretched into hours, and as the first light of dawn began to break over the horizon, I knew that my shift was coming to an end. Yet the nightmare I am trapped in wore on. At last 6 a.m. came, and I was making my way to the entrance of the cemetery, and something came to my attention. The bald man stood right outside the chapel. He held on to something in his hand as he looked directly at me. It was the book. He held the book I found hiding inside the mausoleum. And he was staring right at me. I made an attempt not to notice the book and nodded at him before turning to the entrance of the cemetery and unlocking it. I opened the gates of the cemetery, got in my car and left to go home. On the drive home, I felt like I did something wrong. Only when I arrived back home did I remember something. Rule number nine. By 6 a.m., open the gates and wait for the next security guard to take over. Your shift is not over until the next guard arrives or until 8 a.m. Do not leave the cemetery until the next guard arrives or if it's 8 a.m. I checked the time. It was 6.31 a.m.